this book. There's always this year. Yes. This is a beautiful book. It's been said, ball is life. But <laughs> you have written a book about basketball, poetry, meditation, music, LeBron. Was your intention to do ball is life right here? Everything? Yes, and I, I, in some ways I think I failed. But in other ways I think I succeeded. My hope yeah. was to write a book where anyone could see their own interest in it. You know, yeah. it's like walking to a body of water, looking in and seeing what you most want reflected back to you. So yeah. if you are in this book saying, I want to find a basketball book, you will. If you're yeah. in this book saying, I want to meditate on grief or place or home, you will. Yeah. Yeah. If you are someone who wants to see a complicated relationship with um, lineage and parentage reflected back to you, you will. So in that way, yeah. I, I you know, y you tell the story of seeing your dad shoot a basketball once. Yes, one time. And this book reminded me of how much I love basketball and also how much I watched with my dad. And I wonder, it's not often described this way, is basketball a family sport? It feels like at least a family sport from the standpoint of witness. I grew right. up in a house of Knicks fans, largely. Right. And I remember my mother loving <laughs> Charles Smith and, yeah. you know, the 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 dislike for the Bulls so you know it was strange for me it was like, <laughs> I can't love Michael Jordan because you right, know right. Uh, so in some ways basketball is in a family that loves basketball it gets passed down like so many other things you yeah. learn to love the game through the people you witness loving the game yeah and that I think is a beautiful thing my dad loved the floater oh and, the best and, shot and, yeah the best shot and and you you describe it in here you know and I I just have do you mind if I read some your words to you really isn't that strange. <laughs> An honor, but strange, yes. The, it is, it's got to be weird. The floater, the most romantic shot in the game when done right. It's almost obsessed with drama, almost pausing in the air to make sure you get its good side before it begins to twirl downward. I thought of my dad when I read that. Really? You did that. You read that beautifully, right? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'm in, like the, I'm in the second half of my book tour. You should take over for I'm me. I'm not going to take over, but, um, but it's just one example of the things you described so well. You said you're a Knicks fan, so I'm, you're familiar with there's always next year. Right. But um, <laughs> the, significance be uh, the significance of there's always this year. It presents a real urgency. I mean, so much yep. of this book is also about the passage of time yep. and making peace with the passage of time, which I think a lot of people, I turned 40 last year. Yep. I think a lot of people, as they age, think first about what is being taken from them instead yep. of thinking about the many versions of themselves there are to come. And to present a kind of urgency and an, an affection around the time you have and put it in the immediate moment, for me, yeah. to structure a book around that was a real generosity to myself. Really. Well, yeah, and the book, you know, it's, yeah. And, you know, he's not just saying that. It's actually <laughs> divided into quarters and timeouts. Yeah, I took it seriously. And, 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 really took it seriously. and there's clocks, there's a countdown, you know, and yeah. uh, is that to give me, the reader, a sense of, like, Time is limited. To enjoy this, this yes, page. Yes, I mean, in some ways, to put a, a literal stop clock, a literal countdown clock in a book is to say, you, the reader, and me, the writer, because so much of the process of the book was to make us feel like we are in this together and yeah. understanding yeah. what time is, how much we have left, how much we don't have left. Yeah. But some of the language I was attempting was to slow you down and say, for example, you, we are all certainly going to die, but we are not dead yet. And so, since we are not dead yet, have you ever considered the sunset? And you haven't really considered the sunset because there are infinite sunsets on infinite days as long as you're alive. And right. so that urges people to slow down a bit. You know, I was in Cleveland this past weekend reading both the book and, um, <laughs> and the audio. You know, so I'm, I'm walking around Cleveland and you're writing about Cleveland yes. a lot. A, a lot, lot of Cleveland. Here. And I had forgotten how f***ing good LeBron James is at basketball. Can you believe that? You forgot? Can you believe that? I know, I know. Well, I'm too busy watching the tennis channel. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of LeBron James, but why, why is he an important backdrop for you to tell a story of your life? In, in, for two reasons. One, I got very interested in this idea of LeBron James as an immortal figure, someone right. who we believe will play forever, because it does seem right now yeah. as though he might play forever. But of course, we also know immortality is a lie. You yeah. know, time is undefeated, as they say. Time will get the best of us eventually. However, in a moment where it feels like I could focus in on the idea of immortality, the idea of living forever, yep. it was interesting to me. But also, because for much of my life, LeBron James did seem like a... Uh, a faraway star in the background of my living. 
you know, I write about being homeless and walking through the streets of downtown Columbus and hearing a Cavs game on the background in bars that I could not get into. Right. And so in a very real, literal way, LeBron James is in the background of my living in, in ways I could not access. Yeah. And in any book that analyzed my living and my survival, it felt as though I should render it effectively, render what was in the background that helped me get to the forefront. Well, and that leads to my next question, which is home. Yes. You know, you, I, I believe you moved back to Columbus six or seven years I ago. Did. yeah. You talked about everyone getting something from this. Here I am. I, f I feel like we might have had different childhoods, okay? <laughs> yes. And, man, your description of going back home to Ohio reminds me of when I go home to Michigan of, I, did, I, did I have to leave Michigan to be successful in comedy? Do we have to leave? What is ascension? All of this was hitting me in the face. What is home to you? And did yes. you need to leave it? I don't think I need I mean, one, it's good to talk to another Midwesterner. I'll yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I will say, for me, I never felt the need to leave home. I, I think this book is also trying to realign a consideration of what making it is. And, yeah, and yeah. Ascension not necessarily is something that sends you upward, but anything that moves you from the place you were to the place you're going. Yeah. And sometimes that place geographically is the same, but is emotionally different, is mentally different, all of these things. And for me, if you have uh, a place you love and a place where you can do your work and a place where your name will be cemented for years after you're gone for yeah. anything you have done. You've made it. Even, right. even if what, you know, my mother uh, passed away when I was 13. When my mother passed away, there were grocery workers and postal workers who mourned her passing because of how kind and generous she was to the people right. in her orbit. And therefore, her kindness is a part of that legacy. And so my mother made it. Right. I love so, that. So, you yeah. know, your legacy is... Right. 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 Um, I need, help. I need your help. You wrote sure. that nostalgia is a relentless hustler. Truly. Please educate me. Okay. I know so, you did it in here, but I needed help with you it. You need help with yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> so there's a useful way to say if we sit back and talk about the good old days of our Midwestern youth, yeah. that's a lot of fun, and we could <laughs> yeah. do that. Yeah. But it actually doesn't do anything to inform the way we can live thoughtfully and generously now. Nostalgia for nostalgia's sake is great, yeah. but there's a difference between, say, a porch conversation and a page conversation. Um, a page conversation has to use nostalgia as a way to move your actual present life forward, I think, which, um, and I'm not, you know, porch conversation is fine and fun, yeah. but also, you know, I'm not that interested. We're all getting older in, in the way that, uh, for example, I play basketball now is different. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know I, yeah. I can't play the way I did when I was 20 or even 30. Right, right. And it doesn't really serve me to sit back and say, man, in the good old days, I could run up and down the court and do right. all this other stuff. It, right. it serves me more to say, I cannot do that anymore, but I can right. still do this other series of things yeah. that align with what I know about the game and what I love about the game and what my body is still capable of. And when I do those things, I'm unstoppable for a little while. I love that. Honey, thank you. There's always this year is available now. Hanif Abdul-Rakim.